you know, can and does and has caused uh, health effects. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, radiation standards that are influenced by the, the very industry that it uh, is designed to regulate. So, you know, we do have a situation right now where it's, um, you know, the, the, the radiation protection standards that operate, uh, that these industries operate under are geared towards uh, healthy young males and not the most vulnerable populations like pregnant women and, uh, f- you know, uh, fetuses, where, you know, you w- would think that the most conservative standards would protect the most vulnerable, but uh, that's not true. But, you know, you've got to, I, I think that uh, we have to be very careful of predictions uh, that, uh, are being thrown around uh, very loosely about what the that there will be no health consequence from three multiple meltdowns of a nuclear power plant in one of the most uh, densely populated countries in the world. Uh, and and let me also remind everybody that this accident is still going on. You know, we have 300 tons of radioactive water flowing into the ocean every day since that accident began. And uh, two and a half years ago, and we have a very precarious situation where, um, you know, hundreds of tons of nuclear waste could be involved in an open atmospheric fire still uh, if the um, uh, mitigation efforts uh, are not successful. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I would caution listeners uh, to, um, you know, keep their reservations about these loose predictions that that um you know radiation um in you know coming from these multiple nuclear sites will not have any impact on public health and safety okay well look um sergey vakulenko head of gazprom neft a strategic planning department i want to bring you back in again um the idea of nuclear energy is part of an energy mix here in the united kingdom what's also being debated is the uh, technology of fracking um i'm wondering what you think of that what you th- is this um is fracking in a, an effective way of uh, ensuring Britain's energy future. Do you, are you convinced by that technology? Um, well, it's a mainstay of oil and gas development for last 10 years. I think what you're alluding to is uh, shale gas developments where uh, multi-stage hydro fracturing is uh, a required uh, technology, otherwise you wouldn't be developing uh, these shales. From what I know, uh, shale reserves in the UK are rather limited. So, uh, on the other hand, let me assure you that uh, for maybe 10, 15 or even 20 years, uh, mm, hydrocarbons in the UK and UK waters have been developed using fracturing technologies. And uh, yes. also, I think what you might be alluding to and asking if uh, this shale gas revolution, which uh, employs hydrofracturing in the US, could bring more gas to the UK. I said yes, it would. However, if you calculate the number of uh, liquefaction plants in the US, if you calculate the number of uh, LNG receiving terminals in the UK, and also if you factor in the price that comes from seemingly low Henry Hub prices through all the value chain, transportation to the terminal, liquefaction cost, transportation by LNG tanker, uh, regasification, and so on, this price comes awfully close to the price that could be reliably supplied by um, uh, pipeline gas uh, from Eurasia, from Russia. Malcolm Grimston, so the I, I just economics want to, of this talk, uh, on on the economics and actually on the energy mix, uh, Malcolm. Um, the, the idea of fracking and, and and shale gas and wind farms and other forms of alternative energy that can secure uh, Britain's energy future. Where does that lie now? Now that we've got this announcement about a nuclear energy plant, do you do you, do you envisage further announcements and further uh, commitment by the British government to develop these other technologies to ensure that nuclear power is just simply one part of the mix? Yeah, sure. I mean, we should bear in mind that on the most optimistic assumptions about nuclear new build, we'd be replacing our existing nuclear plants. So we still have the nuclear last year produced about 20% of electricity in the UK. The other 80% is still uh, up for grabs. I, I, I very much share Sergei's uh, 
uh, view on, on shale gas. Um, we clearly have some reserve uh, out there and it's worth looking at it. But I've not seen anybody suggesting it can come anywhere close to replacing what we're losing in terms of depletion of our North Sea reserves. And it's not just a matter of that the price of importing gas from the US is huge. That actually, that has greenhouse gas implications as well. When you, All those technologies not only cost money, they also produce uh, emissions of, of, uh, uh, of gas, uh, uh, of carbon dioxide or methane. And so I, I strongly suspect that it will be uh, imports. At the moment, a large amount of our import coming from Norway – uh, but Norway's reserves themselves are not uh, enormous by a global scale. And then, increasingly, we will tap into a European grid, which is powered not only from Russia and the former Soviet Union, but also from uh, Iran and some of the Middle East countries. I'd love to think that there was a lot of frack gas, because the most frightening statistic of all last year was that our use of coal increased from 30 to 39% for electricity. And as Sergei says, the first thing we have to do if we're serious about climate change is to reduce our use of coal. And gas is the most obvious fuel that can step into that, that role in the short term. I'd like to get your view, Malcolm, on, on fourth generation nuclear plants. I mean, it's a radical idea, but the idea of actually using the waste uh, produced by nuclear plants and recycling that... Um, given that a very small proportion of energy produced is actually, most of it is actually waste, some, more than 90%. Can, is, is that something that can be looked at? Is that too radical? Is the technology there? Um, it, it wouldn't require the building of any more nuclear plants at all. Um, I, I think that's unlikely. I mean, the, the, certainly only in today's station, what are called thermal stations, they only use something like 3% of the uh, of the fuel. Uh, and there are some uh, types of future reactors, fast reactors, and various types of, of uh, new concepts there, which could burn that fuel, not particularly as a way of getting energy, but could burn up the longer-lived radioactive waste. And I have to say, I'm a bit surprised that the, there seems to be such a hysteria over waste in the United States, if I'm hearing it right. I know that President Obama did back out uh, uh, from the Yucca Mountain project there. In Europe, we've got Finland and Sweden, which are building their waste repositories. And actually in Sweden, it's become a, the, the biggest tourist attraction in the local area. People are fascinated by this, not scared by it in any sense whatsoever. Uh, the new plants that, uh, uh, like Hinkley Sea, which just got it uh, not quite go ahead, but a major part of that earlier this week, uh, will have to have facilities to store all of its waste on site for the rest of its uh, uh, operating history and long into the future if necessary. And uh, a separate fund is put away on some very pessimistic assumptions of what waste will call right from the start to make sure that future generations don't have to pay for any of that waste. So all of that is taken into account in the in the financing deal. And in fact, that's uh, around two billion of the 16 billion cost is, is specifically to make sure that future generations don't face that sort of problem. So I think certainly the, perspe the perspective of waste over here is not as I actually don't think it's it's a hysterical issue in the states either. But but uh, I can understand understand that if your president has pulled a perfectly sensible program for waste disposal you might start to worry about what's happened next that's not really the perspective in Europe Paul Gunter uh, in terms of the we're talking about future generations here and and um, you're unconvinced by the safety of, of storage of waste material from nuclear plants do you think that can the technology can ever develop to a point where given that we know that um, that that nuclear uh, material is around for thousands of years that um, that it can ever be perhaps a, a viable modern uh, form of energy that we can rely on. Um, and I'm thinking sort of 40, 50, 60 years ahead of us. Again, I think that, uh, you know, right now, a lot of what's driving the energy policy debate worldwide is global climate change. And uh, to suggest that we uh, put uh, more reliance upon uh, nuclear uh, without a uh, waste management plan for the long term uh, is is a, uh, a catastrophic mistake. Um, you know, I you know, Finland certainly is still going through the debate of whether or not they even want future generations to know that there's a nuclear waste repository out there. Uh, so you know, how if if you leave some kind of hieroglyphic marker for uh, generations to come, or if you basically hope that nature covers over the uh, any disclosure of these sites, that's still an open debate. So and I don't think that's that, that that's hysterical. You know, if you're putting hundreds of thousands of tons of high-level 
uh, nuclear waste uh, into um, the uh, the surface of the Earth. Uh, you're gen- you know you're also going to be generating a lot of heat, which will set up convection currents that can actually draw water to a repository site and set up a uh, a, a, a convection system that involves uh, potentially a steam explosion someday. You know, these are the kinds of surprises that will outlive the uh, the, the 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 policy uh, that that we're forging now. And you know, clearly here in the United States, uh, you know, the fact that we singled out Yucca Mountain, Nevada. Um, as the uh, you know the only scientific venture for what to do with nuclear waste, I think that that's driving a lot of the the reasons for a reevaluation. You know, Yucca Mountain is crisscrossed with um, earthquake faults that uh, in in the faults themselves we evidence volcanic ash, and this is where we're talking about putting 120,000 metric tons of nuclear waste. You know, these are the kinds of questions that are more a political mugging of the state of Nevada than a science venture. Clearly, we're going to have to figure out what to do with this stuff. But the first step in a quest for managing nuclear waste absent the management plan is to stop generating this problem, to okay, put well, a look, cap I'm... on the... Uh... We're going to have to leave it there, Paul. We're, sadly, you. we've run out of time, but that's Paul Gunter, Director of Reactor Oversight Project for Beyond Nuclear in our Washington studio. Our guest in Moscow, Sergei Vakilyenko, Head of Gazprom Neft Strategic Planning Department, and our guest here in London, Malcolm Grimston, uh, Senior Research Fellow at Imperial College London. Thank you for joining me, Brendan Cole, on The Voice of Russia.